Before we begin, just a uh, quick announcement. Uh, tonight's majlis is dedicated to the departed soul of Sayyid Muhammad Ahmed Naqwi, son of Sayyid Haider Hassan Naqwi, and for all marhumeen of the sponsors. Please recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله غريب يا مظلوم كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحل لكم ليلة الصيام الرفث إلى نسائكم هن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهن صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There are many verses in the Holy Quran that describe the relationship between a husband and a wife. The verse that I began with is verse 187 from Surah Al Baqarah. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the relationship between a husband and a wife by saying, Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahum. That you are a garment for your spouse. A wife is a garment for her husband. And a husband is a garment for his wife. And this is a very beautiful expression because it highlights the beauty of this relationship. When you think about the primary functions of a garment, you see that clothes, that garments serve three main functions. The first function of the garment is that it conceals our nakedness. It covers up our blemishes, our imperfections. And hence, when Allah describes the relationship between a husband and a wife, He says that you are garments for one another. 
Meaning, a husband should never expose the shortcomings of his wife. A wife should never expose the shortcomings of her husband. Of course, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, this is how the relationship should be. You should care very much about the dignity of your wife, the dignity of your husband. You should cover their shortcomings in the same way that Allah has covered your shortcomings. This is number one. Your spouse is a garment for you because your spouse is supposed to conceal your shortcomings. Your spouse is a garment for you. The second function of a garment is to adorn. Clothes, garments, they beautify us. They make us attractive. They adorn us. They make us presentable. And this is what you are supposed to do in marriage. You are supposed to adorn each other. You are supposed to bring out the best in each other. You are supposed to nurture their good traits. So they are more beautiful. You are supposed to help them with their shortcomings. So they can be a source of pride for you. And you can be a source of pride for them. Look at the depth of the Qur'an. One word, libas, conveys these deep messages about the purpose of marriage. What we are to achieve and strive for in marriage. So garments they conceal. Garments they adorn and garments protect from the elements. Garments protect you from the heat. Garments protect you from the wind. They protect you from the cold. There is a protective element to garments. And in the relationship between a husband and a wife, you have to be protectors of one another. You protect each other from physical harm. And you also need to protect each other from spiritual harm. You should care about the spiritual trajectory of the life of your spouse. So you are a protection from them from falling into sin. And this is why Islam, this is why in the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, there is so much emphasis on the topic of intimacy between a husband and a wife. Because if this aspect of a marriage is not given serious consideration, it can expose both the husband and the wife to harm, to danger. There's a very beautiful hadith narrated by Imam Jafar al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi. The narration says, Imam al-Sadiq says, جَاءَتِ امْرَأَةُ عُثْمَانِ إِبْنِ مَضْعُونِ إِلَى النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وآله There was a woman, the wife, the wife of Uthman ibn Mad'oon. Uthman ibn Mad'oon was one of the greatest companions of the Prophet. Uthman ibn Mad'oon was so great that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib named his son Uthman after this Uthman ibn Mad'oon. A great personality. You can be a great person and still have marital issues. The wife of that great man, she came to the Prophet and she had a complaint about her husband. What's amazing here is that the Prophet doesn't tell the wife of Uthman that, woman, your husband is a great man. Stop being emotional. 
Stop being high maintenance. Stop being a princess. He listens. Because a husband could be amazing. You could have a pious husband who has a shortcoming. So what does she say? What is her complaint about her husband? She says, Ya Rasulallah, Inna Uthman yasoomu nahar wa yaqoomu layl. Allahu Akbar. What wives used to complain about in the past and what wives complain about today. She says, Ya Rasulullah, my husband, Uthman, he's a pious man. He fasts every day. And at night time, tahajjud, he breaks his fast, he's in his own world. She's implying to the Prophet that my needs as a woman are being neglected. My emotional needs, my physical needs. He's not giving me enough attention in this marriage. What does the Prophet say? Just be patient, it'll be fine. The narration says, فَخَرَجَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مُغْضِبًا يَحْمِلٌ عَلَيْهِ When the Prophet heard this, that there is a husband who's a good man, but he is failing in this one area of his marriage. He's might, he might be providing financially, he's protecting, but he's not emotionally available. He is not thinking about the needs of his wife. The Prophet, when he heard this, the narration says he was so angry that he didn't even put on his sandals. He grabbed his sandals and went. This is the Prophet. He doesn't dismiss these things. He validates the concern of this woman. He doesn't say, you know, come back later. This is something that is urgent. Because every day that goes by that this woman is being neglected, it's bad for their family and it's bad for the community. Because if this marriage breaks, we set a dangerous trend. We set a dangerous trend. So he goes, Hatta ja'a ila Uthman. Straight away, it doesn't mention, maybe he's at his house probably. He went straight to his house. فَوَجَدَهُ يُصَلِّي When he arrived, he saw that Uthman was praying. This is how the Prophet is reacting to a man who's neglecting his wife because he's praying. He's doing extra prayers. Imagine what the Prophet would say to those husbands who are neglecting their wives because they're sitting at shisha bars all night. Imagine what the Prophet would say to those husbands who are playing video games, who are watching football games for hours, and his wife is just a servant bringing food for him. Nothing. This is how the Prophet is reacting to a man who wants to pray salah to Layl and he's ignoring his wife. You see how far we are from the ethics of Islam, from the ethics of the Prophet. Uthman ibn Mal'oon, he's praying, he sees the Prophet has come to the house. Maybe his heart was racing, he doesn't know what's going on. He concludes his prayer. Then what does the Prophet say to him? He says, Ya Uthman, lam yursilni Allahu birrahbaniyyah. Oh Uthman, Allah did not send me so you can act like a monk. He did not send me to advocate for monasticism. وَلَكِنْ بَعَثَنِي بِالْحَنِيفِيَةِ samha. Allah sent me with the religion of truth, but it's a religion of ease. It's a religion of practicality. It's a religion of balance. He says, Asumu wa asalli. O Uthman, I also pray. I also fast. Wa al wa al misa ahli. But I also spend time with my family. I spend time with my wives. 
I am emotionally available to them. Don't think that the way to Allah is only through these acts. There's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he says, Julusul المَرْءَ عِنْدَ عِيَالِهِ When a man, when a husband, when a father spends time with his wife, with his kids, it is greater in the eyes of Allah than doing i'tikaf in my masjid. I'tikaf, not in any masjid. Spending three days in a spiritual retreat in the masjid of the Prophet. Spending an evening with your family where you give them attention. Rasulullah says, this is better. This is how the Prophet was. This is how Ali ibn Abi Talib was. This is how Imam al-Hussein was. Why do you think all of these women were crying when Imam al-Hussein was going to go get killed? Because they were losing not just their financial provider, but their emotional provider. This is what it means to be men. Intimacy is very important in a marriage, my dear brothers and sisters. And because we live in a very high, fa fast-paced world, sometimes we put these things on the back burner. Not today, not tomorrow, next week, the other week, and these things get, they're not prioritized. And it slowly erodes our marriages. There's another tradition from Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi. where he reports from the Prophet, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ لِرَجُّلٍ أَصْبَحْتَ صَائِمًا The Prophet once saw a man, one of his companions, and he says to him, are you fasting today? And the man said, no. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله, he says, فَأَطْعَمْتَ مِسْكِينَا did you feed a poor person today? The man said, Ya Rasulullah, no, I didn't. The Prophet continues, Fa'utta maridha. Did you go visit a sick person today? No, I didn't do that. Fatabata janazatan. Did you attend a funeral today? The man said, No. So the Prophet says, فَرْجِعْ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِكَ فَأَصِبْهُمْ If you haven't done any of these good deeds, I will tell you to do something that has the th same thawab. Go and be intimate with your wife. It's amazing that the Prophet includes intimacy with the spouse among all of these other acts. Because fasting is good for the soul. It also has a social benefit. It makes you more aware of the suffering of the poor. Feeding the poor, obviously. You're at the service of others. It's beneficial to society. Visiting the sick. Attending a funeral. These are all things that benefit the person and it benefits the society. It benefits the community. And being intimate with your wife being intimate with your husband. It's good for your marriage and it's good for the community because when you have these special moments, it strengthens the marriage. And when you have strong marriages, you have a strong community. Islam is the only Abrahamic tradition that highlights that a woman has a strong desire for intimacy. In other religious traditions, it's always the male. The male has the strong impulse and therefore the woman has to accommodate. It revolves around male pleasure. But in, in Islam, we see this very beautiful balance. We have traditions. We have a narration from 
إمام الصادق صلوات الله عليه اللهم صل على My apologies, brothers. I know I make this request every night, but if we can kindly have the brothers especially stand up and take a few steps forward, even a few inches helps. Everybody stand up, move forward as much as you can. رحم الله من ذكر القائم من آل محمد صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Let's recite a third salawat. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, فُضِّلَتِ الْمَرْأَةُ عَلَى الرَّجُلِ بِتِسْعَةٍ وَتِسْعِينَ مِنَ اللَّذَّةِ This is a very important hadith to understand. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, Allah has favored women with 99 parts of pleasure. Meaning if you think about the desire for intimacy in a hundred, in units of 100, Imam al-Sadiq says Allah gave 99 to the women. Now you may wonder, it looks like it's the opposite. Men seem to be the ones who have more difficulty controlling their desires. Why is that? The Imam answers. He says, The reason why you may not notice it, it may be difficult for you to see it, is because Allah showered them with bashfulness. They have this natural haya to them. Yes, society may change that. But in the, then a woman has a more bashful nature. And this is very important, my dear brothers and sisters. This means that men and women are different in the way that they perceive intimacy. And this is why... When you look at our ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he highlights the importance of husbands recognizing this. A woman is not like a man, where it's just like a switch. Men don't need very much to be prepared for intimacy. This is a reality. But our imams, they highlight that don't think a woman is like you. For you, it's like a light switch. But a woman is not like that. A woman has a different nature. And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, إِذَا أَرَادَ أَحَدُكُمْ أَن يَأْتِي أَهْلَ فَلَا يُعَجِّلْهَا The Prophet says, if any of you men, husbands, if you want to go to your wife, you want to be intimate with them, do not be hasty. Do not rush because you're different. Don't treat her the way that you think she perceives intimacy. She's not like you. It takes time for them to, be, to want to be intimate. You have to recognize this because women generally, of course there are always going to be exceptions, but generally women need to feel a connection before they can be intimate. For a man, a man is different, a husband is different. For the husband, the intimacy itself is the connection. This is something that husbands need to understand about their wives. And this is something that wives also need to understand about their husbands. Because a wife might think that, why are you so obsessed with intimacy? What is the big deal? It's just this physical act. You have to understand that in the mind of the man, that the act itself is the connection. 
the intimacy itself reassures the husband that our marriage is good. Our marriage is healthy. So men are much more straightforward and primal in their need for intimacy. This is something that has to be understood by the sisters, by the wives. And husbands have to also understand that a woman is not like you. So don't have this expectation that because I'm in the womb for intimacy, it's like a switch. And if she doesn't have that same enthusiasm, she's a bad wife. She's different. You have to recognize these differences. There is something in our ahadith that when you look at it at first glance, it may seem to favor a man's right to intimacy. Now, of course, a woman also has a right. And sometimes because a woman has this natural haya, she's less likely to express her need for intimacy. And this happens especially when a husband, for example, has to travel. There are husbands that travel for six months, one year, traveling around the world for business. And they don't think a moment that I have a wife who has emotional needs. My respected brothers, Ahlul Bayt teach us that if you are traveling, if you are going to be away from your family, from your wife for more than four months, you need her permission. Because at minimum, you cannot deny her for more than four months. So if you're traveling for six months, a year, this is an example where the husband, who's the head of the household, he has to ask for permission. Because you cannot overlook this haq that Allah gave her. This is a right that she has over you. So you have to pay attention to this. Similarly, a lot of times, there is conflict between husband and wife because of this issue of mismatched libidos. In most cases, the husband desires intimacy more frequently than the wife. When you look at the ahadith, there is a lot of emphasis on wives recognizing this need in their husbands. And not to just dismiss it as you're just concerned about yourself, you're superficial. If you look at the ahadith, you get the sense that when a husband is denied intimacy, he doesn't react the same way as when a woman is denied intimacy. There might be harm in both cases, but the husband when a husband wants to be intimate with his wife and she turns him, turns him down once, twice, there is nothing that damages a husband's ego, his, sense, his healthy ego, his sense of worth as a man than for his wife to deny him intimacy. It's extremely damaging. And it is so damaging that because a man's sense of worth is so connected to this. What happens is that a lot of the problems that you start to have in your marriage are just symptoms of that deeper problem. A man doesn't feel validated. Men, they need intimacy to feel validated. To feel validated as men in the relationship. There is nothing that is more emasculating to a man than when he wants to be intimate with his wife and she says, I'm not, I don't want to be intimate with you. I'm not in the mood. When you look at the ahadith, there's a hadith from Imam Al-Baqir salawatullahi alayhi. And by the way, when we say that it's damaging to the, the ego of the husband, or you, may want, you may think that, let him grow up. Why do we have to cater to the, the fragile egos of men? You're right. Men have a very fragile ego when it comes to this. But it's not about Allah favoring men. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not biased. Allah is neither male or female. He transcends male and female. When Allah says, when the ahadith tell us that do not deny your husband intimacy without a justifiable reason, it's not because Allah favors husbands. It's because Allah favors strong families. Allah wants the family to be strong. He doesn't want resentment to fester. He doesn't want a man to feel emasculated because an emasculated man is harmful to a woman. An emasculated man is more likely to hurt a woman. So Imam al-Baqir, he says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ Allahumma salli ala Allah. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ لِلنِّسَاءِ The Prophet, he had an actual conversation with the ladies in Medina. This shows you how important this issue is. The Prophet had to have a private meeting with the women for them to understand. Because oftentimes men and women, they don't understand each other when it comes to intimacy. The Prophet, he says, لا تطولن صلاتكن لتمنع أزواجكن The Prophet, he says, it seems that some women were very clever during the time of the Prophet. Maybe they had husbands who were very needy. They needed a lot of intimacy from them. And some of these women were thinking that, how am I going to get out of this? This guy's stuck to me like, you know, in the Iraqi tradition, we say, right? just like gum that gets stuck on a blanket. Can't get, off, get him off me. So some of the women probably felt that this, my husband is always in my face. He always wants to be intimate with me. So some of them, what they used to do is, at night time, night time is usually when the husband and wife, they're intimate. Some of the women, what they would do is that they would do their maghrib and isha and they start doing all these extra prayers. Nawafil, and let's bring dua joshin al-kabir, and dua joshin al-sagheer, and I'm praying, I'm busy now, I'm praying. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, do not prolong your prayers, the recommended prayers, and use that as an excuse to deny your husbands. This means what? Rasulullah is giving more priority to intimacy between the spouses than mustahab salah. These are not my words. The Prophet, he understands that this salatul layl that you're doing while your husband feels that he was turned down and he feels hurt is less beneficial than you sticking to the wajib and looking after the needs of your husband. This is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was another woman who came to the Prophet and the narration is from the sixth Imam, إِنَّ مْرَأَةً أَتَتْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لِبَعْضِ الْحَاجَةِ There was a woman who came to the Prophet. And this is amazing that you see women were very comfortable coming to the Prophet and complaining about their husbands. Because they knew the Prophet is fair. He's impartial. And the Prophet never, we don't have narrations where he says, oh, you're being emotional. You know, that you're, just, you're being too difficult. He listened to all of them. And when they made a valid complaint, he honored that. But sometimes the Prophet ﷺ, he recognizes that women are not always mazloom. The Prophet ﷺ is not naive. Just because a woman comes and complains about her husband, it doesn't mean that you say, oh, ya miskina, ya mazlooma. No. Maybe the one who's complaining is part of the problem. So the Prophet ﷺ, he listens to her. She was complaining about her husband. And the Prophet is very sharp. He was able to diagnose the root of the problem. She had complaints about my husband is this, he does this, he has this behavior. She was mentioning the symptoms of the problem. 
the prophet addressed the root of the problem. The prophet says to her, لَعَلَّكِ مِنَ الْمُسَوِّفَاتِ He says, perhaps you are one of those women who is among the delayers. She says, Ya Rasulullah, what do you mean I'm among the delayers? What, do you, what does it mean to be a delayer? She says, الْمَرْأَةُ الَّتِي يَدْعُوهَا زَوْجُهَا لِبَعْضِ الْحَاجَةِ A delayer is that wife who her husband wants to be with her. And she delays him, come back later, come back tomorrow, come back next week. She continues to delay him and the poor guy, he gets tired and he goes to sleep. Don't do that. Now there's a comment that I have to make here, my dear brothers and sisters. You see, marriage and intimacy cannot be governed with a legal mind. What do I mean by this? We always have to go to the fundamental principles that govern marriage. Live with them in kindness. We have a big problem in our community, brothers and sisters, that sometimes we weaponize hadith. Sometimes we weaponize a hadith. Sometimes we are so self-centered that I only think about my desires and I, am, I insist and I assert my right to the detriment of my wife and my family. So I'll give you an example. So imagine there's a husband who wants to be intimate with his wife and your wife is having a bad day. She's tired. She's not in the mood. She's not a machine. She's not in the mood. She's a human being. As I said, she doesn't, it's not a light switch. She gives you a hint that I'm tired today. But then you, what do you do? You said, no, I wrote down all the hadith that the sheikh said and I have a bookmark. I went to the library. Woman, don't be among the musawwifat. Be careful. Look at all these ahadith. This is not what a person of taqwa does. Because those ahadith were not meant to be used by you as a weapon to pressure, to intimidate. Because that is going to damage your marriage. If you want your wife to be intimate with you, do you think that's a romantic thing to do? She's tired, you went to wasail shia and now you're giving her, giving her a fiqh lesson. Oh wow, she's really going to be in the mood now. You want to go into the rijal of the hadith too? Really sweep her off of her feet? Don't weaponize a hadith. Now I'm not saying that these hadith don't exist. But you have to have wisdom. There are many rights that she might have that she's compromised for your comfort. You have to have that spirit. Sometimes you just have to be patient. You have to remind yourself of the meaning, the purpose of marriage. Marriage is not just about me getting what I want. Sometimes you're going to have to do things when you're not in the mood. Sometimes husbands are not in the mood to work. Sorry. Sometimes you got to do things that you're not in the mood to do. And wives also have to learn this too. Because if everybody, if husband and wife only did things when they were in the mood, how are you going to have a family like that? How are you going to have a marriage like that? Marriage requires struggle. Marriage requires effort. Marriage requires you to put the interests of the other ahead of yourself. You're not in the mood, but you know that this is going to make your husband happy. You're in the mood, but your wife is tired. Don't give her grief. Don't become a hadith scholar. You don't talk about a hadith ever. Now all of a sudden you're a muhaddith. There's a beautiful narration from Imam al-Baqir sallallahu alayhi He speaks about the import, importance of gentleness in marriage. Don't be harsh. When you don't get what you want, don't be a man-child. Don't be immature. 
Don't be irritable. Don't be angry. Don't use harsh words. Be dignified. And the same thing goes for the wife. This, both of them have to have this. <inaudible> Gentleness and tenderness has never been added to something except that it beautified it. So for example, your husband wants to be intimate with you, but you're too tired. Instead of just saying, get out of here, buddy. Not today. A more gentle thing would be, I'm really tired, but let's do it tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you. Just that little, that sentence changes the whole dynamic. I'm so sorry, I know I haven't been, I've been so tired lately, but I promise, I promise, I'm not going to turn you away. You're my husband, you're handsome, mashallah, I like your haircut. The husband also has to be the same. When his wife says, when she sends him signals that I'm tired, not today, please not today. You have to be gentle. Think about all of the good things that she did. That you're beautiful. Do you want me to get you a cup of water? Do you want me to massage your feet? Is there anything that I can do for you to help you de-stress? See, that's how you engage. It's much better than going to the, the library and bringing the hadith. It's much more effective. A couple of things regarding the etiquette that I think is very important. There is a narration from the sixth Imam, Al Imam Jafar al Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi. He says, لا يجامع الرجل امرأته وفي البيت صبي فإن ذلك مما يورث الزنا. The ahadith tell us that when a husband and a wife are intimate, it should be private. There should be no one who could see them. There should be no one who could hear them. It should be completely private. And the imam says, do not think that if a, a child can hear or see that, oh, they're just a child, it doesn't matter. The imams of Ahlul Bayt highlight that this can cause great damage to their psyche. If a child is exposed to these scenes of intimacy, the imam says that such a child will have a propensity towards zina when they grow older. You have to be very careful. That you have to make sure that this is private, that children are away. And this is why in many cases I tell spouses that you have to pay attention to the layout of the bedrooms. All of these issues, these are very important because the imams emphasize that this is very dangerous for children to be exposed to this. This is number one. Another thing that is mentioned in the ahadith is the importance of saying Bismillah before you are intimate with your spouse. You see, everything can be used as a vehicle to attain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you may think this seems to be in the opposite realm of spirituality. But in Islam, nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be attained through all of these things. There's a very interesting narration from Abdullah ibn Kathir, companion of the sixth Imam. He says, Kuntu inda Abi Abdullahi jalisan fadhakara shirku shaytan fa'avvamahu hatta afza'ani. This man says, I was sitting with Imam al-Sadiq and the Imam was speaking about how shaytan can become the partner of the human being in this life. And he spoke about how shaitan can become so close to the human being as if he's a partner with them in this life. And he spoke about it in such a way that I became frightened. So I said to the Imam, How can we prevent shaitan from being this close to us, to our families? The Imam says, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ الْجِمَاعِ 
If you want to be intimate with your spouse, فَقُلْ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ There's certain du'as that are mentioned. And if you don't want to memorize the du'a, at least بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ And then the Imam says, ask Allah that if he destines for a child to be born, to protect this child from the influence of shaitan. To ask Allah, oh Allah, if you have destined a child to come from this, then ensure that this child is pious, that this child is righteous, and that this child is protected from the stain of shaitan. And then finally, there is emphasis in the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt that if your wife is pregnant, and you want to be intimate with her while she is pregnant, Ahlul Bayt say, always be in a state of wudu. Because it has an effect on the spiritual development of the child. These are things that we need to be familiar with. There are many things that are mentioned in the books of fiqh, and I leave that to you to read on your own. My brothers and sisters, Ahlul Bayt, they raised their kids. They thought about how to raise their kids, not after they were born. When it came to the way that they selected their spouses, they were already thinking as parents, who am I going to marry to raise a good family? And this is where you see on a night like this, we remember the beloved son of Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba, Al-Qasim Ibn Al-Hasan. This luminous child who lost his father, Imam Al-Hasan, at a very young age. He was three years old when his father was poisoned. And thus he was practically raised by Imam al Hussein. On the eve of Ashura, Imam al Hussein السلام, he summoned his nephew. The Imam السلام, knew that tomorrow there will be a battle. Tomorrow everyone will face, especially the men and the boys, they will face certain death. So the Imam السلام, he wanted to gauge the thoughts of his companions, and especially the younger ones. So he summons his nephew, his beloved nephew, Al-Qasim. Al-Qasim, he comes and he sits beside Imam al Hussein, And Imam al Hussein, like a loving father, he puts his hands around Al-Qasim, who was about 13 years old on that day. He says, Bunay Qasim, كيف الموت عندك? O Qasim, what do you think about death? What do you think about death? Tomorrow there's going to be a battle. And we will not survive tomorrow. Do you have any fear of death? Do you have any anxiety about death? This young boy, he looks up at his uncle Hussein and he says, Ya am fi nusratika ahla min al -asal. Oh, my uncle, death while supporting you is sweeter than honey. This was Al-Qasim. On the day of Ashura, after all of the men were martyred, after Ali al Akbar was slain, after Abel Fadl al Abbas was martyred on the banks of the Euphrates, 
All of the male adults were martyred. There was no one left except the women and the children. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. He looked to the right, he looked to the left. There was no adult male on the plains of Karbala. The Imam alayhi salam cried out, Allah hel min nasrin yansurna. Allah hel min dhabin yadubbu an harami rasulillah. Is there anyone left to help us? Is there anyone out there to support us? At that moment, the young children, the young boys, they came out of their tents. At the head of them was Al Qasim. The young boys cried out, Labbayk Sayyidi Aba Abdullah. Al Qasim, he comes to his uncle Hussein. He says to him, Ya Am, Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, I want permission from you to enter the battlefield. Imam Al Hussein, alayhi salam, he refuses. He doesn't want him to go and fight because, after all, he is only a child. He turns him away. Al Qasim goes to his tent. He retrieves a letter, he retrieves a piece of paper from his tent. He brings it to his uncle Hussein. He brings it to his uncle Hussein and he says to him, Ya Am Ya Aba Abdullah, this is the will of my father, Imam Al Hassan. He wrote this letter before he passed away. Imam Al Hussein opens the letter. He sees the handwriting of his brother, Imam Al Mujtaba, and he begins to cry. He looks at the letter, he sees the letter is addressing Al Qasim. In the letter he says, Ya Bunay, O oh my beloved son Qasim, Ida ra'ayta ammak al Hussein wahidan farida fi ardin yuqalu laha karbala fala tuqassir an nusrati. The letter said, addressing Qasim, O oh Qasim, O oh my beloved son, if you ever see a day when your uncle Hussein is all alone without any helper in a land called Karbala, do not fail in supporting him. The narration says after reading the letter, Imam Al Hussein he hugs Al Qasim. They both cry until both of them faint. This is the only time on the day of Ashura that Aba Abdullah fainted. After the Imam regained consciousness, after Al Qasim stood up, after they wiped their tears, Imam Al Hussein realized that he has to put some armor on the body of Al Qasim. But the armor was too big for his body. The helmets for the adults were too big for his head. So Imam Al Hussein, he took off his turban, he cut the cloth, he cut the cloth in half, he tied a small turban around the head of the boy as a helmet. He took another piece of cloth, he wrapped it around the chest of Al Qasim to act as a piece of armor. But I'm sure Imam Al Hussein was looking at Al Qasim and thinking to himself, look what happened to Abbas despite all the armor that he had. Look what happened to Ali and Al Akbar, and they all were wearing armor. What is going to happen to this boy who does not have any armor? Al Qasim, 
He was so anxious to go and fight. He says, I don't want to remain in this world after Abbas has gone, after Ali Yunil Akbar is gone. The narrations mention that he did not walk onto the battlefield. He ran into the battlefield. The enemies did not know who this young man was. They said, I thought we killed all of the sons of Hussein. I thought all the men were killed. They were yelling out, who is this boy? And this is when Qasim recited, in tunkiruni najlul hasan. سبط النبي والمصطفى والمؤتمان هذا حسين كالأسير المرتان بين أناس لا سقو صوب المزار he fights courageously like a lion in the battlefield. The narration say that he fights. He kills a number of the enemies. But there was a moment when his sandal snapped. The sandal of Qasim snapped. He kneeled down to repair his sandal. Safe. His head was struck with a sword. He fell on the plains of Karbala. He cried out to his uncle, Ya Am Adrikli. Imam Al Hussein, when he saw him fall, when he saw his beloved Qasim fall, he rushed to him. He ran as fast as he could to the battlefield. But when he reached Qasim, he saw that it was too late. He was already severely injured, he was already mortally wounded. Imam Al Hussein, he looks at the face of this boy. He's He's gasping for breath. Imam Al Hussein begins to cry. And he says to him, O oh Qasim, Bunay Qasim, Ya Uzzu ala ammika an tadu fala yujibu. O yujibu ka fala yu'inu. أو يعينك فلا يغني عنك. Oh my beloved Qasim, it hurts my heart that you ask me for help, but I cannot help you. He looks at the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. He says, بعد لقوم قتلوك. بعد لقوم قتلوك. وخصمهم يوم القيامة جدك وأبوك يوم ذكريني من تمر زفة شباب نلعرس ما حروم عنتي دم المصاب يوم ذكريني من تمر زفة شباب من العرس ما حروم عنتي دم المصاب شمعة شبابي من يطفوها حنتي دمي والجفن ذار التراب يوم ذكريني من تمر زفة شباب Mother think of me whenever you see a groom Deprived of marriage and replaced by my blood My candle of youth blown out so early 
my hand was blood and my chafan was to rob. Yumma dhikrini min timur zafat shabab. Yumma dhikrini min timur zafat shabab. من العرس محروم عنتي دم المصاب شمعت شبابي من يطفؤه عنتي دمي والجفن ذار التراب يوم ذكريني من تمر زفة شباب Mother think of me Whenever you see a groom Deprived of marriage And replaced by my blood My candle of youth blown out so early my hand was blood and my kafan was to rob. Yumma dhikrini min timur zafat shabab. Oh, um, oh, um, oh, 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 Uncle, oh, Uncle Hussein, this, this is my is father's my father last will. Will, 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 will. He is he the is one who one ordered me to support you on the day, on the day, that, day that you that need you support. Need support, 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 support. Oh, Uncle, oh, Uncle Hussein, fighting for your cause makes death sweeter than honey. إن تنكروني فأنا نجل الحسن سبط النبي المصطفى والمؤتمن هذا حسين كالأسير المرتهن بين أناس لا سقى صوب المزن Hai Jawa, Qasim Jawa, Hai 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 Hai Jawa. Hai Hai Jawa, Qasim Jawa, Hai Hai Jawa. سب مل کے صدا دنیا سے حسین ہائے ہائے جوا قاسم جوا ہائے ہائے جوا قاسم جوا ہائے ہائے جوا قاسم ہائے ہائے جوا قاسم جوا ہائے ہائے جوا قاسم جوا